Thanks very much. Um, so I want to talk a bit about data science and machine learning. <clears throat> and in particular, I guess I want to give you guys a sense of what's being done right now with, with machine learning uh, and why this should matter to you. Um, and in particular, um, I will try and justify to you my thesis that the number one driving force of uh, global technological change now and in the future is and will continue to be machine learning. And that it will affect every single one of the organizations that you're at or that you will be at, basically from now on. Um, <clears throat> let me start by giving you a sense of kind of the state of technology today. And I'm going to look at four, four technologies in particular. So I'm not going to select these technologies at random. I'm going to um, uh, leverage some research that came out of MIT Sloan. Uh, some of you guys may have seen a book called uh, Race Against the Machine by Andrew McAfee and Eric Bindelson. So uh, these are two researchers from MIT Sloan who have been studying the question, very, very important economic and sociological question. Um, fundamentally speaking, what work do people have to do now and in the future? What are the, what are the things that machines can't do and, and won't be able to do in the future and actually are going to require people? Um, extraordinary result from their research, um, the answer is pretty much nothing. Um, now and in the very near future, uh, we are pretty much at a point where, or very close to a point where there's almost nothing that actually needs people. And they've actually made uh, some pretty compelling analysis showing that there's now a fundamental employment gap already that is caused by there just not being enough work that humans can add value to. Now, I mention this research because <clears throat> in the process of looking at this, they discovered something very interesting. Not only are there things that machines are now doing that until recently required people, there are things that machines are now doing that until just a couple of years before, the leading experts in the field said machines could never ever do. So I'll give you the four examples that they give in their book. One is driving a car. So you guys all know about the Google self-driving car, right? You guys know that it's driven 300,000 miles. Did you know it's only had one accident? Did you know that that one accident was when they turned off the autopilot and a person was driving it? <laughs> right? So that actually came out of some research which was sponsored by DARPA. DARPA actually ran a competition, which is something close to my heart, as I'll describe in a moment. And they basically said, can anybody come up with an algorithm that can drive a car? If you can, I can't remember what the prize was, but we'll pay you a prize. Um, and it was eventually won by a team involving Sebastian Thrum, who uh, a lot of you will now know is at Google building the self-driving car. Um, at the time that prize was announced, nearly every expert who was interviewed said, it is not possible that a computer could ever drive a car on real world conditions. There's just too much to deal with. And yet here we are. The second that they looked at uh, was machine translation. So I actually studied some linguistics back at university and I was taught about things like Chomsky and grammar and all of the massive problems there are in understanding language, you know, human language, this thing can, that can express anything we can think. And the very idea that a computer could understand that language well enough to translate it into some other human language was so far-fetched just to be ludicrous. And yet now you can go to translate.google.com and within about 200 milliseconds you get a nearly as good as human translation and it's improving every year. The third area that they mentioned was creating publication quality prose. So just a few years ago most experts in the field believe that computers could never, or certainly not in our lifetime, create publication quality prose. And yet today, there are companies like Narrative Science that have got algorithms that take as input earnings reports or sports scores and create prose articles that have been published in magazines like Forbes. Who knows, sometime soon, they may even be able to get into high quality magazines. But right now, you know, they can get into Forbes and that's a very good sign. Um, the fourth example they gave was um, winning Jeopardy. 
So Jeopardy, as many of you know, is a very subtle human game show. It's not just about remembering facts, but it's about understanding the subtleties of, of kind of humour and, and trickiness and, and metaphor and so forth. And not only could IBM come up with an algorithm that won Jeopardy, but it beat the two pl greatest players ever to have, play ever to have played a, the game of Jeopardy. And before it was able to do that, most people in the AI world even, even experts said, this is something that will probably never happen in our lifetime. What's this got to do with machine learning? These four most transformative technologies, according to the experts from MIT, are all fundamentally based upon, or nearly entirely driven by, machine learning. I'll give you an example. Translate.google.com. So that was developed by Peter Norvig and his team at Google Research. It actually knows nothing about grammar, nothing about morphology, nothing about anything linguistic at all. It's actually just a statistical model. So what Google did was they downloaded from the internet hundreds of millions of web pages that had already been translated. For example, um, from the UN, everything from the UN gets translated. They built machine learning algorithms that understood the deep correlations and interactions between these documents in two languages. And then when you go to Google Translate and say, translate this from Spanish into English, it just undoes those correlations. It's basically just running a statistical model. So now this area of statistical machine translation powers all of the top machine translation systems in the world. Very similar thing with um, the Jeopardy winning Watson. It is basically three levels of machine learning algorithm built on top of each other. <coughs> At the bottom level is a system which actually understands in quite a fundamental way, um, English text. And it has read Wikipedia, for example. And it understands what is in Wikipedia. It, in fact, at the moment, it is currently reading all of the undergraduate medical texts. So right now, Watson has just passed the second year medical exams and is on the way to being qualified as a doctor. <laughs> so. So interestingly, all of these areas, and I won't go through all of them, but all of these areas basically are direct applications of machine learning. These are not humans who have built a program that says, here is how you translate language, or here is how you answer a Jeopardy question, or here is how you turn an earnings report into a piece of prose. They are statistical algorithms that take data and automatically create the solution to a problem. So this is where we are at right now. These are the most transformative technologies right now. Why is it, why is it that these have surprised us so deeply? Why is it that these are things that experts believed could never happen? Now when you see something like that, you immediately know something. This is a sign of exponential technologies at work. So exponential technologies are technologies where they get multiplicatively better every year. Humans just can't think like that. Right? Humans understand things increasing linearly. But when things improve exponentially every year, we are simply unable to fathom where they will get to next year, the year after, five years' time. You know the famous story about um, the ancient Chinese story about the guy who said, you pay me a grain of rice on, chess, on the first item of a checkerboard, chessboard, and then on the second one, two grains of rice, and the third one, four grains of rice. And the emperor said, OK, I will pay you based on that system. And the amount of rice turned out to be far more than all of the rice in the world. right? Because we don't understand how to think exponentially. Why is machine learning creating fundamentally exponential technologies? For a number of reasons. First of all, humans don't get in the way. Right? The machine is creating the solution from the data. Right? So you get the human out of the loop, and immediately you've avoided something which is fundamentally constrained by our existing capabilities. Instead, you replace it with a computer. And computers are improving exponentially every year, thanks to Moore's law. Furthermore, the software is getting better and better. Right now, generally speaking, the software requires data scientists to make it work really well. For example, my company has a community of over 110,000 data scientists and we organize competitions for them to try and come up with the best solutions to problems. So we've run over 300. Every single one where there's been any kind of 
best in the world scientific or industrial benchmark that has always been surpassed. So this is what happens when you get the whole world's intellect. Um, in fact, Allstate, for example, put up their insurance actuarial algorithms. The thing which says, how much is this person going to cost us in claims next year? Their most important, uh, their most important algorithm. The best that the Allstate team came up with, probably the best actuarial team in the world, that was beaten within two days using a competition by data scientists using machine learning but also using their great creativity. So this system has mapped dark matter for NASA, um, predicted insurance claims for Allstate, built automatic um, essay grading algorithms for the US Department of Education, um, automatically detected um, whale calls in deep oceans, um, all kinds of different things. And interestingly, for the first couple of years, we saw a number of different techniques, um, all of which involved a very large amount of creativity by the data scientists. Something extraordinary has happened in the last year. There's been an extraordinary move in these world's best algorithms towards something called deep learning. Deep learning is a very rich hierarchical uh, neural network algorithm. Um, which, does, which does this machine learning algorithms, these fundamentally transformative technologies, but it does it in an extraordinary way. It does it in a way which requires almost no human ingenuity. I want to give you an example. There's a multi-billion dollar industry, which probably none of you have ever heard of, called chemoinformatics. Chemoinformatics is about automatically identifying good drug candidates by statistically analyzing molecular data. We ran a competition to see if anybody could come up with the world's best chemoinformatics algorithm. Specifically, it was, can you automatically identify molecules that will be toxic? And the sponsor of this was Merck, one of the big pharma companies. And the benchmark was the world's best chemoinformatics algorithm. It was easily beaten by a group of students who spent two weeks on the problem none of whom had any previous experience with anything to do with biology, using deep learning. All they did was they took Merck's data and they basically threw it at a deep learning algorithm and what came out was the world's best chemoinformatics algorithm. Right now, as I speak, deep learning is the best algorithm in the world for understanding cursive handwriting, understanding spoken language, automatically developing new drugs using chemoinformatics, recognizing the content of images, understanding videos, and many others. In every single one of these areas, these have all been developed by somebody with no previous background in that particular field. Once we get to a point where we hit the world's best algorithm from deep learning, as we have in the last year or two in these areas, in the next year, generally those algorithms get twice as good. Right? So we're now at a point where many of the world's toughest problems are being solved by algorithms that are in almost entirely automated and are getting exponentially better every year. And we're at a point where researchers believe that we're very close to a time where there just isn't enough work to go around because computers can do it all. So this is both exciting and terrifying. Right? It's exciting because you know, we may be on the verge of the technological singularity, and it may be driven by machine learning. We may be at a point where technology will increase so rapidly, it's as if it all happened at once. We may no longer have scarcity. But even if that happens, what happens as we get there? What happens as we move towards that new equilibrium? Where, for example, in a few years' time, 10% of humanity can't add economic value. And then a couple of years later, 20% of humanity can't add economic value. Are we going to adjust our systems in such a way that we ensure that people get fed and people get clothed and that we avoid the kind of massive uprisings that this can create? Right? So the power of machine learning to drive massive technological change. And you know, you're all here because you care deeply about something. There's something, some world problem you want to fix or some idea you want to make happen. It's very, very likely that if you leverage machine learning, you will do it exponentially better. So it has the opportunity to solve so many of our problems, and yet at the same time, there is this fundamental question that 
is it actually going to remove our humanity from us? If we can't create and add value, what does that leave for us? So this is really what I wanted to explain to you today, is to say, if you're not looking at machine learning right now, you should be. Maybe you only have a few years. Um, and furthermore, as you look at it, consider what it means for the long term. It's here now. It's already the world's best algorithm for many of our toughest problems. And every time somebody applies deep learning to a new area, it very rapidly becomes the best in the world. Thanks very much. Thank you.